He went from an undrafted NFL free agent to two-time pro bowler and a member of the New Orleans Saints Hall of Fame. Our guest today, stay tuned to find out. I'm Roy Ice, welcome to Lifestyle Magazine. This is Lifestyle Magazine with your host, Roy Ice, and key experts, Mike Tucker, Dr. Sharmini Long, Lionel LaMountain, and Marie Mitchell. And we're talking with NFL Hall of Fame kicker, John Carney. Now, John, how did you start out as a kicker? You know, like so many other kickers, uh, soccer background, mm-hmm. love the game of soccer, yeah. played since fifth grade, should have started earlier. <laughs> uh, loved it, but uh, went to a high school, Cardinal Newman High School down in West Palm Beach, Florida. They had a great football program, Sam Bunnick, historical coach down there. And it was almost a rite of passage for the young men at that school to be a part of that football program. So I did what my buddies did. We went out for the football team. I thought I was a receiver. I, I quickly learned I wasn't. Uh, I was sitting on something hard like that called a bench for a while, and I figured, you know, I can kick an object. Maybe I should learn how to kick this football and get off the bench. And so uh, that's what I did. Uh, my, my intent at the time was just to kick in high school, to get on the field and be part of the Crusader Nation, and um, took me to Notre Dame. Yeah, so incredible career at Notre Dame. Is that when you decided that you might have a career in this? Uh, I, it was, uh, again, at, at the University of Notre Dame, which was a great experience historical program as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, My focus was just get on the field at Notre Dame, be part of the Fighting Irish. And Mm -hmm. uh, at some point I heard some coaches talking about, hey, this kid may have a chance to play on Sundays. I was like, oh, really? Next level. So then I started thinking, okay, what do I have to do to get myself to that level? And so that was another journey that started. Yeah. So then you went to the next level. You didn't just go to the next level. You you, uh, became a Hall of Famer. You, you have done so much in the NFL. I know stats are always wrong. As <laughs> I did my own cyber stalking of you, I saw uh, at least five records that you hold, four of which are most field goals in a single game. And, and the top one I saw was six in a single game. You you were tied for that. That's incredible. 2,062 points in your career? Yes. That's a lot for a yeah. kicker. So See, the trick is playing on teams that don't have a good offense, but get in the red zone. <laughs> so yeah, give you lots of opportunities. Yeah, they can't get yeah. into the end zone, yeah. but uh, yeah, it's, it's time for you. But that's a lot of pressure. So how do you deal with, because we just saw, I just saw some games recently where it's down to three seconds, make or break, the kicker comes out. That has to be a ton of pressure. Uh, it is, and it is what you make it. Uh, you prepare for that, not before the game, during the game, but that preparation starts actually back in the off season. Hmm. Uh, it also begins the Monday first first preparation for that week of practice leading up to that Sunday's game. Uh, and you put yourself in that position. You put yourself in what's the, the highest pressure pack situation, the most difficult challenge that could come my way during the course of this game, and that's what you prepare for. And you go out there, and that's the only thing going through your mind. Uh, swing thoughts, focus, where I need to send that ball. What are some of the things that most people wouldn't even imagine that you have to be thinking about when you're kicking? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long equation. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and there's, a, there's a, a handful of variables that are out of your control, like wind and field. Uh, the ball sometimes varies during, from game to game. Uh, the rush, the opponent, uh, the stadium. Okay, so many things out of your control. And then on this side of the equation, things that are controllable. So mm-hmm. your, your mental, uh, physical, spiritual preparation, your equipment, uh, your strength and conditioning during the course of the week, uh, the reps you took, the reps you didn't take mm-hmm. to come in fresh, um, working with that unit, your field goal unit, your snapper and holder, very important uh, unit there. Mm-hmm. Uh, that chemistry has to be you know, spot on. Yeah. Uh, so those are all things that go into that equation of being successful or unfortunately sometimes not. Yeah. I've always thought it's silly when they call the timeout to ice the, the kicker. Did that ever bother you? Or that was another it. thing you planned for? I love it. I would like to call more timeouts actually. So Did they give you more time to mentally prepare? It does. It does. It yeah. gives you more time on the field to 
get comfortable with the environment. You know, you may pick out a better target line than you initially would have if, if you were in a rush situation. Right. Um, it's like, you know, allowing a, a golfer to you spend another minute or two lining up that putt. So his, his, his opportunity at success is going to be greatly increased. And so um, I love the timeouts. Now, one of the records that you hold is probably the most impressive to me personally. How is it that you were able to maintain four decades of playing in the NFL? Well, I'm a one-trick pony, so <laughs> I couldn't find anything else to do. But uh, I, I was very blessed to stay healthy. Yeah. Uh, I did my best to learn and to try to grow my game every year, every offseason. Season ends, okay, what could I do better next year? Um, how can I continue to fool management and coaches that I can still do this job? Um, so it's always it's a con, it's a continuation of of learning and growing. Mm -hmm. uh, with my clients now, high school, college, and pro, I talk I talk about kicker IQ. It's always learning and rising mm -hmm. uh, to the occasion, but improving your kicker IQ, um, being more hyper observant at everything that's everything that needs to be uh, focused on, uh, mentally observed. Uh, and during the course of the game, in pregame, preparing yourself for every situation and what the environment is giving you yeah. and what can change in the environment. Uh, but I was very blessed. Um, and God was God and my faith is a big part of my career. Yeah. Had it not been my foundation and my faith, my career uh, may have not have existed, to be honest with you. Well, I want to talk to you more about that, but we have to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to be joined by his wife, Holly Carney, and talk about how life was and is more than just football. We're joined by John's wife, Holly. Holly, welcome. So glad Thank you're you. with Thank you. Thank you for having us. Awesome. Now, John had mentioned just before we took a break that faith had a role in his football career. And I'm not going to ask him about that. I'm going to ask you about that. What did you see? Well, I see what I still see. I think that John is um, God's ambassador. Hmm. And he always says that his actions may be the only Bible anyone ever reads. Hmm. I'm demonstrative in my faith, and I might be saying, don't look at my actions, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but seriously, he would pray before every game, and he would pray not whether they win or lose, I think the wives always pray that way, mm. but he would pray for wisdom, courage, strength, and poise. Mm. Also, another neat thing that you did and taught our kids to do, he would pick a scripture for the season, and one that stood out to me that was for the whole season was, I work for God, not man. And that was an important verse, and he will put it somewhere in his Bible or in his notes, and my kids do the same thing. That's amazing. Now, you talk about kids, yeah. and you have a situation that is not unique. You are a blended family. How, how many years have you been married? Almost 25. Great. And you have kids from? So when I met John, yeah. he had a little beautiful little blonde little rug rat in preschool. And he was just absolutely adorable. And I never thought that I would fall in love with a man that already had a child, but that's what God gave me. And I'm a former junior high school teacher. So the cutest thing that ever happened when he proposed, uh, Luke is our oldest son's name. He would run around saying, we're getting married, we're getting married. <laughs> I mean, just the idea for a child to have a family unit. Yeah. They just want to be loved and they want everyone to love each other. And, and that's kind of the way it went. A lot of parents have a tough time being a step parent. What are some of the things that you've had to do to navigate that? Well, I'll tell you from my observation and our experience together, uh, Holly accepted Luke as her own. And... Mm -hmm. um, and she took it uh, as a mission, not only to love him as one of our own, but also to teach that and model that for others that were in similar mm -hmm. situations. Yeah, I think when you come into my house, if I have gigantic pictures of our two biological children, there's one, you can't tell which one's not the biological child. Yeah. And I think we didn't, we threw out words like step because I would never say he's my stepson because I don't want to alienate him because he was there first yeah. because he's he's not separated. He's his firstborn son. And um, those words are some people love using them and throwing them around. For me, I just wanted everyone to be all inclusive. I just yeah. every child just wants normalcy. 
Well, I believe you were so passionate about that that you even took the time and all the energy <laughs> to write a book about it. Right. Tell me about that. Right. Well, it's called Wicked Not. Not all stepmothers are wicked. And what's so funny about it is so many of our close family friends, some that we had known their whole lives, had said, why would you write this? You're not a stepmom. I'm like, yes, I am. And this book is for stepmoms, foster moms, adoptive moms. Um, my brother passed away and we adopted, fostered and adopted his only daughter um, when she was in eighth grade. I mean, this, this is about moms, regardless of the adjective in front of the name. Yeah. And so I wrote this book because no one likes to be the stepmom, the step anything. It's hard. It's a hard, it's a, it's a hard, brutal reality. And this is kind of my story of growing up dreaming of love. And one thing I knew I never wanted to be was a stepmother. Yeah. And it's, it's a true story. When people stop and think about it, they don't want to be the stepmom, the stepdad. Mm -hmm. But it's actually really challenging to love kids who aren't your own the same as you love kids that are your own for most people. What did you guys do to erase that line and what would be helpful for others? Well, you can't let the adult issues get in the way and that's the frustrating part, that child support, write it, bless it, hmm. it's your child. Yeah. You know, after high school, we'll still pay the bills, he's our child. Those adult issues you have to put behind you and you have to say all the time, which we said to each other, focus on Luke, focus on the child, hmm. not the adult issues. It just poisons the wells. Yeah. So, what feedback have you had from the book so far? Oh, I've had so. M I've had um, what one funny little story is. There's a family that was uh, not blended, and the little girl wanted this read to her every night <laughs> before bed. <laughs> but um, I've had so many different reactions. I've been on airplanes where I said to a flight attendant, "Oh yeah, I just wrote a book, um, Wicked Not," and she's like, "I hated my stepmother." I've asked a couple celebrities if they would write the um, forward for me, and they, I hated my stepmom. I hated my stepmom, and so. Mm -hmm. I've also had, oh, I love my stepmom. Where can I get your book? And I have a, a bracelet that we created and um, it says Apple Mom. Right. And that means it's for everyone, foster, adopted, whatever. It's just a mom that is wants to nourish their child. So it's, uh, usually this is a sign of poison and wicked. Yeah. But actually, if you give your child an apple that's nourishing, right? Yeah. So you really do have to take the adults out of it, focus on the child. And John always prayed that God would fill in the gaps, Yeah. whatever we were failing or missing, or that. that the Lord would just fill in the gaps. That's so true. The kids do have to be the focus. Now we have to take a break, but when we come back, we're going to talk about how John and Holly use sports and activity to help communities. And joining us in the conversation will be our activity key specialist, Marie Mitchell. No two families are alike, but did you know that 40% of families in the United States are blended? A blended family consists of a couple who have at least one biological child and one adopted child, whether through a second marriage or adoption. But these families are faced with their own unique challenges such as parenting a stepchild, visitations with an ex-spouse, or grieving loss after a divorce. But there is so much love and happiness to be found when you choose to bring new faces into your family. Here are some tips for helping to manage the difficulties of a newly blended family. Nurture your marriage and learn to communicate well. Always consider everyone's unique perspective. Encourage healthy relationships between your stepchild and their biological parent communicate with other blended families, and most important of all, be a team and love one another. Welcome back to our conversation with John and Holly Carney. Now, you guys have some incredible charities. Talk to me about some of the ones that you have. Well, when I was playing for the San Diego Chargers, uh, we started a charity called uh, Kickstart for Kids. Yeah. Uh, uh, had branches, um, um, kicks on the green golf tournament, kickstart your heart motorcycle charity ride. Uh, we are raising money and awareness for a charity in San Diego called Fresh Start Surgical Gifts. Uh, and that was a charity that did surgery on children with physical deformities, scars, burns, victims of violence. And mm. so um, that was a big part of our lives uh, during the 90s in my, my charger run. And then uh, we went to New Orleans to play with the Saints. And then we parlayed our time and efforts into dinner with the pros. We would have 
John bring in all his NFL athletes and some baseball players and basketball, just any athlete. You know, San Diego's filled with filled. retired. They're yeah. a dime yeah. a dozen, yeah. <laughs> but we love them all. Mm -hmm. And they would come in and serve dinner to our guests. They were the waiters, and they would have cute little aprons, and they would auction them off. Um, they would do so many fun things to try to raise money, uh -huh. and we would support many um, faith-based charities mm -hmm. yeah. in Southern California. And for the last decade, we were really um, proponents and advocates of Mary's Mercy Center and Veronica's Home over in Riverside County, um, San Bernardino. And um, Father Mike Berry has, oh my goodness, has fed the homeless men there uh, for years, over 200, 300 meals a week. He has created a village now. It's called Mary's Village. So it's a third portion of that where there it can house 85 men, homeless wow. men, showers and all this. But one of the neat things is Veronica's home. So our kids grew up watching us go to all these galas, yeah. sometimes five a week. And at Thanksgiving one year, they had a silent auction of their crafts okay. for our family members to buy so they could give the money to Mary's Mercy Center. Wow. And then when our daughter Kiki turned 12, she, in lieu of birthday presents for herself, had everyone be, bring a birthday present for a child at Veronica's home. So those are mothers that are unwed with children seven and under. Hmm. Wow. And they help them for 12 months to 24 months get on their feet and have a beautiful home, mm -hmm. safe, beautiful place to stay with their children. And Is that something that your kids want to get into now? You said that your daughter, as a young age, just decided for gifts, everyone brings something to donate. Is that I think um, our children are very much into philanthropy and charity, and they give often. In fact, our youngest two were at the University of Notre Dame. Our son just graduated. Even though they were busy, they volunteered working with children of need in wow. South Bend, Indiana. And then our oldest son, Luke, was super involved with Dinner with the Pros because he had his whole fraternity come and wow. volunteer. He, they would set up in their suits and ties and just be like the guests and they would tear down and it was just a, a gift to have all our kids involved in all our charity work. Wow, that's so great. And you know, their hearts are, are totally on, involved with wow. all that. You guys have done an incredible job in establishing a legacy that your kids are repeating. Now, uh, John, you have an incredible facility as well. Talk to me about, about your facility. So it started in my garage, as <laughs> most garage gyms do. And uh, <clears throat> when I was playing for the Saints and would come back to San Diego, just getting a good workout and a timely workout in the local gyms wasn't happening. So I started putting equipment into the garage and then some of my teammates like Steve Weatherford and Nick Folk would start joining me in the off season to work out. And so we had a good little thing going there. And then uh, a strike happened uh, around 2009 or 10 and we had more NFL guys join us. So when I was slipping into retirement, moved all the equipment out of the house into a basically a warehouse gym because my wife was tired of men in the garage <laughs> at 6 a.m. Oh, and <laughs> some great 80s heavy metal music going on. So, uh, so moved it into a facility. Um, it's just bare bones, you know, serious stuff working out you know we don't have showers uh we don't have air conditioning you know it's it's serious stuff but we we do skill specific training for kickers punters and long snappers from the high school college and pro levels and so m my passion is to take a guy from one level to the next so high school to college college to pro or pro stay in the pros mm -hmm. you know okay yeah your two-year three-year four-year career is great let's make it a 10-year career and let's see some longevity here. So um, that's what we do. And guys come from all over the country. Uh, we usually, we average probably about 15 guys a year that will actually move to San Diego so they can train with us full time. Yeah. Uh, we're okay. on the field three days a week. We're in the gym five days a week. Uh, and we cover the whole gamut, mental game, uh, mechanics, preparation, uh, you name it. And um, it's a lot of fun. That's what I love to do. There's so many, uh, facilities around, I mean, countrywide for all levels of athletics. Um, is that how yours differs from anyone else's? Does I think so, because again, skill specific. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, the, the kicking and punting position um, is so unique, but it's so narrow that uh, so many trainers who are great trainers, but have not lived the life of a kicker or punter at the high levels, <clears throat> 
aren't exactly really sure or positive or confident that they're coaching the exact thing that that player needs uh, physically. And so we bring that to the player. Okay. Uh, we watch them progress and, um, and they know that these are proven techniques, proven routines. Uh, we're, we're addressing the correct uh, body parts, muscle groups that are gonna bring them to the next level on the field. To find a, a coach that knows every athlete's different. Yeah. You know, just raising my children and one's a tennis player, one's a basketball player. And besides them having separate, you know, uh, sports, mentally they're different. And to find the right facility with the right coaches that cater to that and nurture that, it's so important. So Absolutely. I just love hearing about your, you know, the, men the mental part that goes into that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Very and, impressive. And I love to work out with my guys and something will pop in someone's head about, uh, you know, pressure kicks or uh, what's your pregame routine like or am I kicking too much or, or punting too little and so our conversations and the get education and the coaching continue yeah. which is great oh, which is great yeah. That's well amazing. both of you are, are so impressive I've been a fan of yours since I started following you in in New Orleans um, and now I'm a fan of both of you because you found a way to take not only your activity but to add purpose to it and greater purpose, deeper purpose, and higher higher purpose to that. It's been a delight. Unfortunately, we're out of time and we have to go, but when we come back after this break, I have a few final thoughts. One of the best ways that you can work on our aware key number five, existence, is to take a closer look at the activities that you're passionate about. We often mistake activity for productivity. But to really grow in your understanding of your personal existence, one of the best things you can do is to find activities that will benefit and bless the members of your community and invest in them so that they might live their best life possible. For more meaningful life tips and an opportunity to view this show and all other episodes, visit our website at lifestyle.org.